talking with the experts. In episode 564, learn how to take control of your personal brand online with Jason Barnard's CaliCube process. Credibility phase. Um, of course, you, you start with what you have. You clean up your house first and you make the most of what you've got. And that's what we do at CaliCube for our clients. Then you think, well, where do I need to publish? Where do I need to stand for my audience to see me and to perceive me as authoritative. So for example, I write for Forbes, I write for entrepreneur.com. These are places where you would expect to see an entrepreneur and they are places that are authoritative in and of themselves. So that adds to my authority with the entrepreneurial space. If I write for Rolling Stone magazine, that's gonna help me as a musician. And then you have the problem is Google will start to say, well, actually, is he now a musician again or is he still an entrepreneur? And you really don't want to confuse the child because the child is still learning. Talking with the Experts. Welcome to Talking with the Experts. This is where we discuss great ideas to take your business to the next level. How do we know these ideas work? Well, it's because we're talking with business owners who are using these ideas. Business owners who have years of experience and expertise. All things business by business owners for business owners. And now, here is your host, Rose Davidson. Hello, and welcome to Talking with the Experts. I'm your host, Rose Davidson, from TalkingWithTheExperts.com. Talking with the Experts is all about business by business owners for business owners. You can find it on all podcasting, streaming platforms, and on YouTube. And today, it's my very special honour to introduce you to Jason Barnard. And Jason's going to be discussing with us how we can take back control of our personal brand online. And some of the things he's going to share with us is how to take control of your brand narrative, how to turn yourself into a thought leader with your peers, and how to become famous to your audience. And a little bit about Jason. He is an entrepreneur and a CEO of CaliCube. And Jason specializes in online brand management, And his superhero skill is his ability to influence and reshape Google's focus on an individual or a company. This isn't just optimization. It's a strategic manipulation of digital perceptions. He's been working on Google since the year it was incorporated, and he has been successfully manipulating Google from day one, literally. How many people do you personally know who can say that? Jason, welcome to Talking With The Experts. I am so excited to learn about how we can manipulate Google for our own benefit. Right, brilliant. Lovely to be here, Rose. Thank you very much. The word manipulate sounds a little bit naughty, um, but what we really mean by manipulate is change its perception to what we feel is important. So we take back control. Absolutely, yeah. And manipulate, you know, as you say, does have a... Um, a negative can have a negative connotation, but it, you know, I didn't take it in that way. Where manipulate to me was to how to make everything better to, and work for us rather than uh, you know working for everyone else. So oh, let me good. let me ask you how you a, a, and how and why did you want to do this? And you know why do you want to make us better at what we're doing? And why Google? Um. Well, number one, why am I doing this? Uh, I was watching a TEDx talk that my girlfriend introduced me to, where the lady was talking about why do you actually do the job you do? Not just are you qualified for it, but where does it come from in your soul? Mm. And the answer for me is entertaining and helping people, sharing something positive with the world. And I started in music. I had a, a rock band, punk folk. Uh, we were entertaining people and making their lives a little bit better. Then I did a cartoon series uh, with my ex-wife, Juan Kuala, and it was educational, entertaining games, songs, and a TV series. And that was a positive addition to the world where we're entertaining and educating small children aged up to 10. And now it's all about changing 
the perception that these machines, Google, ChatGPT, Siri, Alexa, Bing, perplexity, changing the perception that they have of you mm. in your favor. Because they're all trying to understand all of us, whether we like it or not, and they're doing it 24 seven. And if we don't take the responsibility of helping them to understand us personally, our little corner of the internet, They'll just do it themselves and they'll probably get it wrong. And at CaliCube, we found the secret source for educating these machines. We treat them as children. They're small children who want to learn, who are keen to learn, who just don't understand. And if we explain to them very clearly who we are, what we do and who we serve, they will understand and they will perceive us the way we want to be perceived and therefore represent us the way we want to be represented. It's really important, isn't it, that we you know we're in this age of AI that uh, we instruct the uh, the AI to to represent us in in the correct way. Because as you're right, they often get it wrong, and if you don't, you know, um, ask them or tell them what you need or what you want from them, that they they won't give you back the answers that you need for, or want. Um, I've you know, when I started ChatGPT, I actually found a little bit where you could, you know, it's like a profile thing where you can fill out what you want, um, how they, you want ChatGTP to to uh, mm. make up your posts or if you, you know, and tells you a little, you tell it a little bit about yourself or how you want them to write your your, your posts or your, your articles or whatever it is that it happens to be that you're asking them to do. Um, so it is important that you instruct them or train them. Otherwise, they are going to know, aren't they? Yeah, and this takes it a huge step further because that's your use of ChatGPT. If you ask ChatGPT using the prompt that you just talked about that helps you get the most out of ChatGPT as a user, but you ask it, who is Jason Barnard? What does it answer? That's what I control. I control what it answers about me to everybody else in the world when they're using ChatGPT. So it's slightly yeah. different in, in terms of approach. Um, I'm getting the machine to understand me, whoever asks about me. Well, how do we go about doing that so that, you know, we are out in the in the world um, as we want other people to see us? Well, it's really, really simple uh, in terms of the process because all of these machines are looking for one place on the web where you state the facts about yourself. And it should be, ideally, your own website. And it can be a one-page website for a person, that's absolutely fine. But it needs to be you talking about you. And they're actively looking for it. John Mueller from Google has confirmed this is exactly what they're doing. If they can't find what we call the entity home on your own website, they will identify the entity home, which is where you live, online in the machine's brain, they will use your social media channel or they will use your company website. Or even worse, they might use uh, IMDB or Wikipedia or Wikidata where you have no control. The idea is if you own the website, you control the information and you control it over time. So if you do nothing, the machine will identify a social media profile or your company website. The social media profile is on a website you don't own. Twitter could close tomorrow. Mm. LinkedIn could change your profile page tomorrow and there's nothing you could do about it. Your own website, you always control. So you need that entity home, your own website, where you describe clearly who you are, what you do, and who you serve. Then you go around the web, the, the web and you correct all the information about you so that it corresponds to what you've said on your entity home. So you need complete consistency. And then you link from the entity home to those sources and from those sources back to your entity home. So you get a hub, spoke, and wheel model. Mm. And your website is the center, the hub, that Google and ChatGPT and Bing, Microsoft, Alexa, Siri, all use for the initial source of information and then they verify it across the web. And of course, if you've corrected everything, the verification makes sense and the machine understands. Mm. And that's it. 
If you can do that, you, you have control of your representation in these machines. You have self-determination in an AI world. All right, that makes a lot of sense. But how do we go about changing those other sites, you know, uh, that that ha may have information about us? How do we go and change that information? Well, some of them you can change directly, for example, your social media profiles. Uh, some of them are public databases. Uh, Wikipedia, you can change it. Um, Crunchbase, IMDB all public databases that you can go in and change. So you need to go in and change them. And then any, what we call third party websites where you have no control, if you know the person who runs the website, you can ask them to change it. If you don't know them, you need to reach out to them to ask them to change it. And I mean, I've written this book, you can see here behind me, and it explains that for businesses, but the same thing applies for people. And also mm -hmm. on our website, calicube.com, spelled with a K, you can you can get all this information for free mm. but the the approach of going to the effort of correcting the information seems like a lot of effort and it is but once you've corrected it you're good to go somebody who's changed something for you won't change it back again afterwards so you're, you're fine and then all you need to do is worry over time or work over time on anything new that you create any new references to you and make sure they're consistent and they corroborate. Yeah, interesting. I mean, I've noticed uh, when you when you do a Google search and there's a, a website reference comes up on the right side of the screen, um, you can say uh, that you want to um, offer um, amendments to that particular listing. Um, yes. do, do people take notice of that? Yeah, that's a really good point. The thing on the right is called a knowledge panel, and it's Google's understanding of the facts about somebody. And you can claim yours. So if you have a knowledge panel on the right-hand side on desktop when you search on Google, you can claim it, and you can ask for changes. There are, however, several problems. Number one is anybody can give feedback. All claiming the knowledge panel does is put you to the front of the queue. That means that a Google employee will look at your request for a change of information before they look at anybody else's, which is great. However, a lot of the time they can't change the information. They don't have the power to do so. And sometimes they change the information for you, but it switches back after a couple of weeks. And the reason for both of these things is the algorithm is in control, not the people. If we talk about AI, we talk about a machine that learns or learns to learn even. The machine is independent and not even the Google engineers, the chat GPT engineers know exactly what's going on in its brain. And what happens with the knowledge panel is if the Google engineer, the Google employee says, okay, this subtitle is wrong, for example. It says Jason Bernard musician and I want it to say Jason Bernard entrepreneur. They switch it to entrepreneur the machine then comes along and says, well, actually, I disagree. The web suggests he's a musician primarily and an entrepreneur second, so I'm going to switch it back to musician. So even getting them to change it doesn't help. If I don't change the information on the web that has convinced the machine that I'm a musician to start with. Makes perfect sense, Jason. Actually, you know, um, that's that's a really good point, that yeah, if we don't change the hub, and, and the information that's in that, then no one else around the outside of that hub is going to know that the information is incorrect. So, yeah, it makes mm -hmm. a heap of sense, really does. Mm -hmm. So how can we turn ourselves then into thought, a thought leader with, you know, the rest of the world? Which is great follow-up because that first part is un what we call understandability, take control. The second part of the CaliQ process, which is what I'm describing today, is credibility. How do you demonstrate that you are an authoritative thought leader within your industry? And the answer to that is everywhere on that wheel, everywhere you're standing, you should be standing where your real audience is looking. So if your audience is on LinkedIn, don't stand on Twitter. If your audience is on uh, Business Insider, don't stand on IMDB. You need to be standing where your audience is looking and demonstrating your credibility to them. And that credibility is going to be explaining your education. I have a degree in economics, therefore I'm an expert entrepreneur, let's say. 
I have an award. Uh, I have had famous people in the entrepreneurial space on my podcast. I need to name check them. I need to point out my award. I need to explain my education. I've got 26 years of internet experience. I've got 34 years since I created my first company. My companies have got 66 years cumulative profitability. If I mention all of those things, you as a human being will think, wow, this guy is a great entrepreneur. But if I write it on those pages where I'm sending where I'm looking, two things will happen to Google and ChatGPT. They will understand who my audience is, understand that I'm relevant to that audience, understand that I'm credible for that audience. And so I've nailed step two, which is credibility. We have understandability, which is control, credibility, which is thought leadership. Hmm. So, yeah, it looks like I have to go back and change all my profiles now. <laughs> yes. And for the credibility phase, um, of course, you, you start with what you have. You clean up your house first and you make the most of what you've got. And that's what we do at CaliQ for our clients. Then you think, well, where do I need to publish? Where do I need to stand for my audience to see me and to perceive me as authoritative? So, for example, I write for Forbes. I write for entrepreneur.com. These are places where you would expect to see an entrepreneur and they are places that are authoritative in and of themselves. So that adds to my authority with the entrepreneurial space. If I write for Rolling Stone magazine, that's going to help me as a musician. And then you have the problem is Google will start to say, well, actually, is he now a musician again or is he still an entrepreneur? And you really don't want to confuse the child because the child is still learning. Yeah, yeah, no. Yep, I agree. I agree. You want to keep it as simple as possible. The, and, uh, you know, don't confuse the machine because there's nothing like a confused machine. It's a bit like your computer. If you press too many keys at once, it's going to not know yeah. what you're doing. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Don't confuse your audience. I've made the mistake of talking too much on my website about my music career and my cartoon career. And people looking for me today are interested in me as an entrepreneur, me as a digital marketer who can help them with their personal brand and controlling their personal brand, building their personal brand online. They don't care about the blue dog. They don't care about the music group. So I don't want to confuse my audience either. So if you look at it, what you're doing is explaining and resonating with your audience. And that's what makes the machines understand. So think about your audience first, the machines will follow. Mm. Yeah, excellent, excellent point. Now, how do we become famous with that audience then? If you know, if we followed step one and two, the third step is how you know to become famous with our audience. How do we do that? Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's what we call deliverability, ubiquity. You need to create the content because if you're standing on Forbes, let's say, and Forbes gives me immediate credibility as an entrepreneur, I need to write articles on Forbes in order to create the content to convince my audience. So I'll write articles on Forbes, which I do every couple of months. But that also gives the machines the material to introduce me to the subset of their users who are my audience. Mm -hmm. So if somebody asks Google, uh, who's a great entrepreneur, it will say Jason Barnard. If you ask G ChatGPT, name some great entrepreneurs in the digital marketing space, it will name Jason Barnard and it will cite one of my articles. Further than that, if you ask ChatGPT, how do I create a knowledge panel? ChatGPT can answer and it answers using something that I provided on my own website. So I create content also on my own website. I've given ChatGPT the information it needed to reply to a question and ChatGPT doesn't always cite its sources, but sometimes does. Perplexity always cites its sources. Google cites its sources. So that gives me an opportunity for them to say, well, you can create a knowledge panel with a three-step CaliQ process. So I'm cited, I'm name-checked. Then they give the link. Then the person says, okay, who can help me with that? Jason Barnard, CaliQ. That is bringing the person down the funnel from understanding how to get a knowledge panel to who can help them with it to purchase. So it becomes a way of, when you create this content, it becomes a way of filling up the top of the funnel 
the awareness phase, being cited by the machines in the conversations they're having with their users, then consideration, we get name checked when they start to say, well, who's the best solution? Then when they say, well, who should I choose? We get what Fabrice Canel from Bing, Microsoft Bing calls the perfect click. The person has made a decision by going down the funnel on Bing, on Google, on ChatGPT, whichever, whichever machine it is, and they click through to your website ready to buy because they've been advised and helped by a machine they trust. So mm -hmm. if you look at it that way, ChatGPT, Microsoft Bing, Google, Google Gemini, Alexa Siri are all the biggest influencers you can possibly think of. Think mm. of the biggest TikTok influencer ever. Millions of followers. These machines are talking to billions of people, having billions of micro niche conversations with them every day. That makes them the most important influencer in the world. Mm. Yeah, I, I get that. But, you know, can they be, um, can they be you know, over, overly controlling do you think of our you know of our world i i yes. i've noticed that you know I, i've had a conversation in front of my laptop about something and the next thing i know there's an ad popping up about that very certain thing are they really listening to us <laughs> i i would say yes uh, to what extent i don't know uh, but certainly it's it's uncanny uh, are they listening to us to a certain extent, definitely, because they track us online. They track us when we're logged into our accounts, especially Google with Gmail, with Google Analytics, with Google Webmasters. Once you've logged into your Google account, it knows what you're doing. But then you've allowed it to do that and you've accepted the terms and conditions, so that's fine. After that, beyond that, are they listening to us when we're on the phone? Question I don't know the answer to. Yeah. Uh, certainly it's uncanny, but you can also look at other things that potentially help them to understand uh, with your phone. I'll give you a really simple example. You have an Android phone. I go to the cafe across the road. It knows I'm in the cafe across the road because it can map that to Google Maps. Mm. If I then go to a toy shop, it knows I've been looking at toys, so it can give me an ad for toys. So it hasn't listened to me, but it's tracked me. And it's mm. tracked me without me really thinking about it. And... If you really push it far, and this is creepy, if I go to a cafe and sit with, four, let's say, four other people who all have Android phones and are all logged into their Google account, and we are all digital marketers, it is probable in Google's mind that we've been talking about digital marketing. Mm. So you, you get this kind of idea that even without listening to us, the machines can figure some of this stuff out from the data we're uh, actively sharing with them, having accepted their terms and conditions. And using Google Maps, for example, allows them to track us over time and space. And that's the exchange we're making. It's kind of a deal with the devil. I will have the facility of using Google Maps to get from A to B and to see which restaurants are good in a town I don't know. And in exchange, I'm giving you a lot of data about what I do every day. Mm. Yeah, that's true, I guess, you know, and a lot of it probably is a bit of a coincidence. It just happened you were talking about something and then there's an ad that pops up that, you know, is about that. So, you know, I, I'm still sitting on the fence a little bit about whether they're, you know, actually listening to us. But what you say about Google Maps is quite right. Um, you know, they track mm. you, they track me, we meet um, they know we're in the same place. What we do for for a living, um, yeah, of course, they're going to figure it out. Some, you know, that we must be talking about something that's, you know, yeah, similar to what we both do. So, yeah, I, I get that. I mean, I don't think yeah. that it, it's actually, you know, reading our brains or anything like that. So, <laughs> well, I think what we don't really grasp as human beings is the scale of the data these machines have. And to what extent that the machines can now just join it together without another human being knowing how they're doing it. Because the AI mm. is actually people saying to a machine, here's a big lot of data, here's some guidelines, go and achieve this result. And the machine just achieves the result without telling us how they do it. So when you consider Google Maps, plus you logged into your Google account, plus what you were doing on the computer, plus knowing your age, plus knowing your gender, plus knowing 
uh, your interests from the websites you browse on Chrome. That's a lot of information that they can put together to put the pieces of the puzzle together to figure out exactly what you're doing on any given day. Yeah, absolutely. So it's, it's kind of creepy, but not creepy at the same time, in the sense that we've accepted, we've made this this deal with the devil. And, yeah, absolutely. you know, the, 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 the convenience of it is wonderful. The cost is complete lack of privacy. Yeah. Yeah, I guess, that you know, um, for us to be able to, to take control of what, um, you know, these machines are doing, I think, you know, it's got to be, it's got to help us, in, and not, not in, only in our business, but in our personal life as well, because, you know, we're getting seen out in the world as the, as the right type of people to be, you know, be associating yeah. with. No, 100%. I mean, that, to, coming back to our core topic is truly how do these machines understand us um, and how can we influence that and how can we influence who they present us to amongst their users so that we make sure it's our audience and how they represent us to those people. And that's yeah. where the CaliQ process really comes into its own because that understandability control, credibility, thought leadership, deliverability, ubiquitousness within our industry, famousness, you've absolutely nailed it. So it's a very simple three-step process. And I've just explained it in what, 20 minutes? Yeah, pretty much. Yeah, it, it's not, it actually isn't as hard as, as you think it would be, you, you know. No. Um, I mean, I've noticed that when I go and do a search of my name, I come up listed in about eight eight places. So, um, and, and most of the information most often uh, focuses on uh, my um, passion project rather than my podcast or um mm or the things that the, the service that I offer. So I'm going to have to go around now and change how my website and what's on there and, and how I'm viewed on LinkedIn and on Facebook as well. Yeah. So, yeah, they're really great tips, Jason. Thank you so much for but sharing you, those because now I'll go and change them. Yeah, no, sorry, I'm, I'm interrupting, but you've just made a really, 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 really important point that you do multiple things. We all have multiple facets. You've got a passion project. You've got a business. You've got a podcast you need to help the machines understand which is the one they should be focusing on. Mm. If you want them to bring the right people to your door, they need to know which one to focus on. Mm. If you want them to represent you primarily as a business person, you need to educate them that the passion project exists and it's you, but it's secondary. And as you rightly said, that depends on how you present these things on your website and how much they're prioritized on your website. And then how they're prioritized in the digital ecosystem, your digital footprint around the world. So, yep. yes, give them the right focus. And we come right back to the beginning. Why did I start doing this? Because 12 years ago, if you search my name, it said Jason Barnard is the voice actor for a cartoon blue dog. And I wanted to be recognized as a digital marketer and my potential clients my prospects were searching my name and then they didn't sign the contract because they said, well, you're a voice actor. Why would mm. we trust you with our digital marketing? So I set about changing Google's perception of me to become a digital marketer. And in the last 12 years, I've developed this very simple process, obviously going along a very complex route with lots of mishaps and problems and mistakes to figure out in this immensely compl complex world, how do I create a system that is very simple that anybody can implement that allows them to take control and get self-determination in an AI world? And I've done it. Well, congratulations to you. And I, we all have to get, you know, our little butts in gear and, and uh, you know, start working on our profiles and our websites and, and, you know, wherever our digital footprint lands, we have to start working on that so that, our audience knows what we do and who we do it for. So, yeah, I, I love what you shared with us, Jason. And, and um, so you have a, 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 um, a guide. guide, some guides that you want to share with our audience. What can people find in those guides? 60 pages that explain exactly what you need to do, the CaliQ process. And we have one guide for people and another guide for corporations. So if you go along to CaliCube, K-A-L-I-C-U-B-E dot com slash guides, you can download them for free. And as I was saying before we started the interview, we're giving it away for free because this is important and because everybody needs it. 
And whether you want to do it or not, that's a different question. If you want to do it, it's free, go and do it. And then people say to me, well, how are you going to make a living if you're giving it all away? The answer is we serve people who understand that this is more work than it at first appears, that it's very difficult to maintain that consistency and that clarity across your entire digital footprint. And over time, in particular, it becomes increasingly difficult. And that if they work with us, we'll do it more effectively, more efficiently, and we'll take the weight off their shoulders. Mm. And somebody who's the CEO of a company who has much better things to do than manage the micro parts of their digital footprint hands it over to us, we do it for them, and they can sleep soundly knowing that it's been taken care of. Mm, sounds great. Love. I'll, I'll have to go and have a check out those guides and see, you know, uh, how much um, it can help me to change whatever I'm doing. Now, you can find Jason on Facebook at Jason Martin Barnard, or he's on LinkedIn under Jason Barnard, and he's also his website. He has a Twitter account, a YouTube account. Um, he has a, a website, jasonbarnard.com, and he is the brand SERP guy. He's uh, is the, the brand SERP guy and a professional link to kellycube.com, and he's got an about page. So if you want to find out all about Jason, head over to kellycube.com, and uh, you can find out all about his uh how he has worked out his website about section and so that the, yeah. uh, the machines, you know, can put him in front of the right audience. Yeah, I mean, and if you want to find me, um, in fact, the simplest thing to say is just search my name on Google, J-A-S-O-N-B-A-R-N-A-R-D, and it will show all of the resources you just mentioned in pretty much that order, mm. in the order that I feel is important for my audience. And then my audience can just go through the search result for my name and choose how they engage with me. And as you said, if you want to know how we do it at CaliCube, go to my About page, have a look at how that's built, take it away. Absolutely. Jason, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much for sharing today. I think we all need to have a bit, do a bit more work on our digital footprint and um, you know, get in front of the right people. Thank you very much. That was absolutely delightful, Rose. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. You've been listening to Talking with the Experts, hosted by Rose Davidson. Make sure you have a look at our back catalogue over at talkingwiththeexperts.com and be sure to subscribe to our podcast so you don't miss out on any episode. We look forward to your company next time.